Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will be discussing organizations that support Native American communities with special guests. Carly Badhart Bull, Executive Director of the Native Ways Foundation of Minnesota, and Shannon O'Glocklin, Chief Executive and Attorney at the Association on American Indian Affairs. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited about this. We're we're the day after the uh, Indigenous Peoples Day um, that was announced uh, this year. And it's so interesting uh, when we talk about the reality of American history to juxtapose um, the Indigenous Peoples Day um, uh, tag to the Columbus Day tag, right? And what that actually means, because it really does encompass the tensions and the realities of relationships between European settlers and indigenous people. So let's talk a little bit about your organization, uh, Carly. Let's talk about the impetus behind it. I, I thought it was really fascinating. And then Shannon, let's let's move on to yours. And let's talk about uh, the America that we want to build into the future, an America that is uh, more uh, attuned to the own, uh, it, the realities of its own history and formed by them and is stronger uh, for that knowledge. Uh, Carly, uh, talk a little bit about your your work um, at the Native Ways Foundi- uh, Federation. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark, for having us. Carly um, I introduced myself in my Dakota language. I said, hello, I'm happy to see you all who I can see others. I can't see, but I'm happy to, to be on this, on this, on this call with you. Um, so I'm a citizen of the Flandreau Santee Nation, and I live in uh, Minnesota Makoche, also known as Minnesota, which is in our Dakota homelands. And I'm the executive director of, of Native Ways Federation. Native Ways is a national Native nonprofit organization, and our mission is to activate and expand informed giving in in Indian country through donor education and advocacy. So our focus is on representing and supporting Native nonprofits. Um, We were founded over 15 years ago by leaders from our seven founding member organizations, and and Shannon's organization, Association on American Indian Affairs, is, is one of our founding member organizations, so proud to be able to say that. Um, our other founding member organizations, all national, well-established, well-respected Native nonprofits, uh, American Indian Science and Engineering Society, Native American Rights Fund, um, National ICWA, Running Strong, First Nations Development Institute, and the American Indian College Fund. So our founding members started coming together again over 15 years ago to discuss a number of common agenda items, and namely uh, the issue of the lack of adequate philanthropic funding to organizations in Indian country. And I know we're going to talk more about that. Um, And the issue that the fact that a large percentage of funds, which are labeled as serving Indian country, were actually going to non-native led organizations. And unfortunately, that's still a problem. Um, And so we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I taught, I took this job um, at the at the beginning of, of COVID in April 2020, um, in large part because I saw the potential power of this this collective voice, this collective entity across our sector. Um, you know, this idea of of um, honoring the collective over over the individual uh, aligns very much with our indigenous values. Um, but we also come from many unique nations, cultures. Um, our organizations have expertise in many different areas and different parts of the region. Um, but we know that we're stronger together. So our focus is on United Native nonprofits um, and helping to bring those strengths to the table um, to uh, collectively help the sector rise. You know, in many respects, what you're doing is very similar to movements throughout American history, where you have uh, people coming together who might be part of one group, but also disparate subgroups. And yeah. you, have, you have women coming together for uh, to help uh, uh, women, uh, you know, make co- common cause on issues that affect particularly women. Or you have um, uh, Latin Hispanic uh, peoples from different uh, national origins coming together to deal with, with with those kinds of kinds of issues. So what you're doing is you're creating common cause, and I'm I'm sure that there are discussions of what falls into the common cause piece, and what falls into uh, into particular tribal concerns. 
Uh, but let's go to Shannon. Shannon, you have a, a, a intersecting take, right, on what, what Carly is doing. Talk a little bit about the Association um, of American Indian Affairs. Sure. Um, and Halito, my name is Shannon O'Loughlin. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and I'm the CEO and attorney for the Association on American Indian Affairs. We have been around since 1922. We're the oldest nonprofit serving Indian country. And our work has mirrored um, and fought against changes in federal Indian policy that has sought to eliminate our uh, self-determination, sovereignty, and other treaty rights uh, over the last hundred years. Uh, and phil philanthropy has always been, uh, uh, it also mirrors the changes in federal Indian law and policy that has happened throughout history. Um, you, back when this organization was formed, uh, the policy of the day was assimilation was boarding schools, was removing land from Native American nations um, and doing everything but uh, allowing for diversity and allowing for uh, human rights in Indian country. Uh, over time, you see that policy kind of going up and down um, as far as uh, supporting tribes with the Indian uh, Reorganization Act in the 30s, and then trying to eliminate tribes in the 40s and 50s with the relocation and termination programs, and then up again in the 60s and 70s with Self-Determination Act programs. And today we're, we've been on a slow uprise uh, with uh, law and legislation and efforts to support Indian country self-determination and sovereignty. Um, and Philanthropy has somewhat followed that uh, along with us. However, uh, we still are not getting the, the same type of, of funding that other organizations get who are uh, as national and, and well-respected as, as we are. And, and there's a lot of reasons why and, and Native Ways Federation is looking into those issues. Uh, our our goals for the organization is to create a world where diverse Native American cultures are lived, protected, and respected. Um, and our programs are usually those types of programs that are not uh, uh, economic development programs. So they seek to support culture, cultural heritage, language, families, uh, youth, juvenile justice issues. Uh, and those issues uh, often don't get a lot of attention in the press. So I, I, I think this is really fascinating because it really goes to the nature of the world that we want to inhabit. The easiest way to, uh, to create unity is to uh, destroy diversity. Um, you basically say there is only one right way. If you, if you look at what's going on in, in China and the favoring of, of Han Chinese and then the destruction of, of different um, ethnic traditions um, to the extent that they diverge from, from, uh, from sort of the Han Chinese sort of center, right? You see this kind of a replication of what happened in the earlier days of settlement in the United States. These techniques are, are very much in common. How do we create a country in the United States where we have a country, we have a certain uh, level of unity, but we also have respect and we also have different perspectives that are honored and shared, um, are not necessarily imposed on one tribe to another or one peoples to another, but we have some level of, of commonality, but also difference in, in a way that is energizing and allows for prosperity and allows for meritocracy and so on. How do we do this? Because it's so much easier to basically destroy diversity and say it's all one thing. Shannon, you, you have this really amazing historical perspective as the, old, the oldest uh, Native American uh, organization here. Um, how have your constituents viewed this um, throughout these last hundred years? 
it's really interesting. Uh, it has improved, but it hasn't changed a lot. So the inquiries that the association receives from the public um, uh, are just as concerning of, as they've been over the last hundred years. So we still get inquiries about um, uh, wanting to learn more about why Indians live in teepees. We get inquiries about, um, I got my DNA tested and I'm a Native American. How do I get my Indian money? Um, we There's all sorts of misinformation about what it means to be indigenous in the United States. Well, it's even very little. within tribal communities, there are, there are real controversies, right? Where you have uh, membership in tribes or non-membership in tribes, what's the definition uh, there? We, we, we've seen some um, coverage of, of, uh, of African Americans who have who have um, who are in discussions of, of what a, what a freedman is uh, versus uh, a member of a tribe. Um, these are complicated issues, aren't they? They are, and, and I think it, it stems from the lack of public education of understanding what Indian nations are. There's 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States and more than 300 other tribal groups that are either recognized by state and local governments or not recognized, um, but still exist today with their own diverse cultures and also their own diverse legal systems and governance structures. And each one of them assert their inherent sovereignty to determine uh, their citizenship, uh, just like the United States does or, or any state does. So I think there, there are some essential uh, basic pieces of information that the public does not yet understand about Indian country. And one of the reasons for this, I think, is when we look at our public education system, what is taught in our public schools with our children tends to stop about 1900. And so there's no understanding of who contemporary indigenous peoples are or that we still exist as strong governing nations with uh, diverse languages and cultures that aren't about what kind of food I eat or what, what I dress or what I look like, um, but are about so many other things. Um, as indigenous peoples. A another piece of it is that our laws are still quite backward and based on a uh, Supreme Court precedent that relies on um, uh, this schizophrenia that tribes are sovereign, but yet the United States serves as the guardian of Indian people and that, that Indian people are unable to take care of themselves. So there's some uh, essential problems in our legal system and also uh, huge problems in our public education when it comes to uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives and indigenous peoples in general. Carly, I saw you nodding. Um, how, do we, how do we fix this, this issue? Because um, I, I would endorse just from my own experience and the experience of my kids in terms of the education system, you actually have to go and look for truth. Uh, when, particularly when you're uh, a white person or you're, you're in, a, in, um, in most school districts, I would suspect in the United States, you have to kind of seek out truth when it comes to anything having to do with the realities of, of Native peoples today. How do you, how do you fix that? Well, absolutely. The, the truth telling piece is key. Education is key. Awareness building is key. Um, one of our other founding member organizations, First Nations Development Institute, um, were part of putting out a report a few years ago that was funded by the Kellogg Foundation called Reclaiming Native Truth. And there's a lot of good information in that report. Highly recommend it. Um, one piece, um, it was a national study. And one of the statistics they shared was that across the nation, less than 40 across the nation, 40% um, of those surveyed didn't know that Native people still exist. 40%. 40 40%. Um, and 40%. And that surprised a lot of people outside of Indian country. In Indian country, it did not because we were feeling it. We live it. Um, that erasure, um, that invisibility is a huge issue. And it's a huge obstacle that we have um, to, to face every day, um, including in the area of philanthropy, um, which is where, you know, we're trying to bring that Native 
representation because what we see is there's an you know huge lack of funding in Indian country um, and it's very much connected that lack of awareness lack of education um, and that needs to that needs to change and so that's one of the things we're working on um, so it needs to change across the board in the public education system um, in government um, in the media um, our native nonprofits are doing this work every single day, no matter what area they're working in, when they come in and they're talking to a funder or they're talking to government officials, whoever they're talking to, they always have to start with the Indian country 101 um, of just letting folks know that we even still exist. And so we're trying to help with some of that um, at Native Ways. One of the things that, that happens very often when I'm in these discussions is, is um, uh, leaders sometimes say, why, why do we have to? take on ourselves this role of educating you white guys right why why is that i mean that's not necessarily our responsibility and i think it's a i think it's a valid point but it, but in a sense you can't heal ignorance by not communicating right and and the knowledge holders are the knowledge holders right so if i'm ignorant and i am mostly ignorant I need to be informed by people like you. How do you how do you view this, Carly? Well, I mean, a huge part of this is that self reflection. The, the the fact that you're even able to recognize that is is key. And then, what do you do with it? And so, that's one of the things that we're trying to do at Native Ways is is we we do a lot of the education component. Um, and we don't let it go um, because next is, OK, you now that you're aware, now that there's some awareness and folks have a sense of 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 the history of this nation, this co- this is a collective history of this nation. OK, now what? Um, and so that's where we're interested in having conversations with folks who are interested in systemic change, um, who are interested in actual changing, you know, changing behaviors, changing the ways that we do things and listening to Native people listening to our communities, our families, our kids, our leaders, because we're the ones who know how to address these issues. Um, and so, so, you know, part of it is, you know, getting the awareness out there and then not letting it go. And then folks, non-Native folks taking responsibility um, with, you know, once you know something, you know it. And so you, you, you have to do something. You have to actually work to, uh, to, to, to make that change. You may actually have to change some of your own behavior. You may be doing some things or saying some things that you don't even know or recognize. It may be intentional, but that are either not supporting or actually even hindering um, you know, the progress for, for our communities. And so by being in relationship, I think that's a big part of it, being in relationship with Native communities, with Native nonprofits, Native nations, um, and, and finding out from them, you know, what can we do to help? I have a great example uh, about this, Mark, if, if you don't mind. Um, there's a law called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. And what it does is it requires museums and federal agencies to repatriate uh, human remains that have been stolen from graves, along with the burial belongings of those people, our ancestors, um, cultural objects and, and sacred objects, and return them to affiliated tribal nations and lineal descendants. Uh, when this bill was um, uh, up for discussion and debate, um, in 89 and 1990, museums and archaeology and anthropology, anthropology associations were up in arms because they thought this would remove all of their collections and they would have nothing to teach the public. What ended up happening over the last 30 years is those institutions that were willing to consult and work with tribes about the collections in their institutions, finally understood the depth of of information and and cultural knowledge that they had collected um, improperly and started building relationships with those tribal nations so that they could better serve the public in their museum exhibits and at the same time returning and restoring cultures that had been stolen away. Um, We see that as well in um, the sale of tribal antiquities. Um, Oftentimes dealers and auction houses will sell very sensitive cultural items, labeling them artifacts or antiquities. 
But those items uh, were all, <laughs> all of those cultural sacred items, funerary objects, uh, they're all items that could not have been removed from a tribe without a proper authority, without, without the tribal leadership saying, yes, you can have these very sensitive items. So they're essentially stolen. Uh, so it's been really difficult to try to get people to change their perspective of how they view indigenous peoples and for what purpose they're viewing them for. You know, so is it so I can make money out of this, this sensitive object and kind of gain that power of this old ancient culture? Or are you really trying to understand the nation from which that object came from and returning it and building relation and healing, uh, healing a relationship that has been uh, really destroyed by the, by the ignorance um, and the commercialization of our cultures. Plus you decontextualize the object itself, right? When you, when you, um, when you take an object and you uh, break the bonds of communication between the creators of those mm -hmm. objects and their descendants, Right? You do exactly the opposite of what a curator wants, which is to understand the context in which that object existed. It create, it's created. You want to have the people who are knowledge holders be communicating with the public through curators or directly and telling the stories about how the objects were made, what they were used for, and so on. If you take a look at what, what goes on in, in, um, in different museums, they become so much richer when they've been able to talk about uh, the techniques that are used to create uh, artifacts and objects, whether it's in um, the Nelson Atkins Museum, or you take a look at what goes on in the Anchorage Museum, or you take a look at the Peabody Essex Museum, or all these other institutions, not to mention uh, the various heritage uh, organizations that are describing uh, these techniques from Hawaii over to Maine, down to Florida, um, you now have a much more rich uh, story that was uh, able to be told in the 70s, for example. Right. But tribes are the primary experts of their cultural heritage. And if they're not being included in the discussions about uh, their items and objects and absolutely their ancestors' human remains, um, then, then there's a problem. There, there's um, uh, uh, huge stereotypes that we're not addressing. And these are in our academic institutions. Um, our, our museums, our public museums and historical societies that we go and visit. And, and so we can all take a little responsibility when we um, uh, uh, go to those places to, to learn more about what their collections hold and if they're complying with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act and, and working with tribes. We have a uh, annual repatriation conference that we do every year. And for those who want to learn more about repatriation and protection of, of sacred places, our website um, has more information about our conference. I don't know if I should plug my plug our website. Is that okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. Go ahead. It's uh, uh, indian-affairs.org. Uh, go to the button repatriation conference and learn more. Thank, thanks, Mark, for letting me plug that. And Carly, um, we had asked a, a question. It was very interesting, the response. We'd asked whether um, uh, uh, Native American uh, groups, the, the, the question was, do you feel that Native American peoples receive the respect and support provided by other to other Americans by government, nonprofits, and the private sector. And we, we had uh, yes, right, being a, a, a small pro proportion, but everyone else basically said, uh, no, that's not the case. But I want to challenge uh, the notion here, the notions here, because if you take a look at different groups in the United States uh, that, are, that are shown to be, um, to receive less um, uh, resources, uh, Native groups, African American groups, Latino Hispanic groups, Asian groups, women, and so on and so forth. Everybody can claim a deficit, but if everybody claims a deficit, then there is no deficit, right? 100% of resources go away, and all of a sudden everybody's claiming a deficit. There's got to be some logical fallacy here. So let's not necessarily talk about the statistics, although you, uh, you know, I welcome uh, any. Uh, knowledge that you can provide us uh, in the statistical side. But let's talk about how do you, if, if we have imbalances in our society, 
how do we deal with with addressing those imbalances in a way that creates some sort of cohesion and exchange so that it, it doesn't become transactional or it doesn't become a fight where you have red states and blue, all that nonsense, right? Instead, we're actually talking to each other and trying to do the right thing for everyone. How do we deal with this, Carla? Well, I think, again, it goes back to relationship building. Relationship building and taking the time to be human, taking the time to have conversations, to share our stories. Because when we do that, you know, when we share our stories, it it humanizes those statistics. And so folks get a better understanding of of how things got to be the the way that they are. We live in this very divisive society. Um, And by sharing our stories, by helping folks understand um, the the individual perspectives, we can get to that, that collective um, you know, success that we're looking for as, as a nation, we can start to approach that, that healing that needs to happen. You know, colonization has impacted Native people, uh, you know, it, 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 it in a lot of ways, it's impacted everybody. Um, You know, the systems that are set up, um, that were set up intentionally to disenfranchise us are actually disenfranchising everybody. Uh, And so, you know, by listening to Native voices, by listening to Native perspectives, by promoting and elevating Native leaders um, in different spaces, if, if, you know, when you go into a space and there's no Native representation in the room, ask why that is, Um, advocate to get native representation in that room. Um, And that's across the board, including in philanthropy, again, which is an area that that we we focus on. Um, You know, there is a a very low percentage of native representation in that space. I worked in philanthropy for six years um, and uh, the lack of education there is huge. And it's not that I think, you know, foundations don't want to support native people. I think sometimes they sometimes they forget about us or they think they are, you know, they put together grant programs and strategies that they've figured out on paper that are going to work really well for us. And they don't. And we would have told them that or probably did tell them that if they did talk to us. Um, and so but that relationship building piece, um, that making sure that folks are in the room, that we're having conversations, that we're we're taking the time uh, to listen to one another is huge. Is it, is it as simple as the uh, as, as becoming better at the soft stuff? Because we, we look at the lawsuits or we look at the politicians or we look at, at some of these dramatic acts and maybe it isn't about dramatic acts. Maybe it's about just talking to each other. Is, 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 is Carly's point correct, Shannon, that, that part of this is just being people, right? Being people and sharing my experience, not conceding my experience, but actually glorying in it and sharing it with somebody else. I will say really quick, I don't think that the that means we don't need the dramatic acts sometimes. Um, in fact, um, having those relationships, helping to share those stories can help folks to be better allies in some of those situations where we do need to take things to the courts, where we do need to take things to, um, to, to spaces that we don't necessarily want to be in, but that's necessary. Yes, we've had some great dramatic acts recently. And what that has helped all of us do is better educate the public about what's going on in Indian country. We had the first ever White House proclamation on Indigenous Peoples Day. It was not about Columbus at all. It was about Indigenous Peoples Day. We have a bicameral bill um, introduced to um, uh, affirm Indigenous Peoples Day and replace Columbus Day. Uh, we have a Truth and Healing Commission being uh, uh, bill being developed in Congress that will help with healing from the boarding school era, uh, where um, our children were stolen and kidnapped during the 1800s and 1900s and put in faraway boarding schools, where they were taught in a military style and their language was taken away. They were not allowed um, uh, to practice their culture. Um, they were often abused. They were often borrowed out um, for uh, as a workforce um, in, in kitchens and farms. Uh, you know, so, so there's some really good things, those big dramatic events that are happening right now that we haven't seen before um, that are going to help all of us come to an understanding of of those human being values 
that we all share to live in a world that's safe and secure, where our environment is clean and protected, and that we listen to one another and are able to, to build this country together instead of um, in, in some kind of grandiose pyramid scheme where the top 1% sit on top and we're still at the bottom. Well, we're coming to the end of our time. Carly, I'm going to give you the last word, but uh, before we do that, I wanted to just um, share uh, two of the uh, polls that we had. Uh, one of the heartening uh, things is that 100% of the people who responded to our second poll, how important is it for other Americans to be exposed to Native American history, arts, and culture as part of our core understanding of this country, 100% of the people who responded said, said it was important, either absolutely necessary, which was 83%, and 70% said uh, important. Um, and and I personally endorse it. I, I think that it's just really important that we understand the realities behind the country. It, they're so much better than the myths, right? Um, and then the second, um, the second poll was, was a very interesting, and we're going to give you uh, the last word, Carly. We, we said, uh, what, what do you think are the top two challenges faced by Native Americans? And the two top challenges um, were seen as historic injustice and trauma that must be recognized. And then the other one was uh, was poverty in different forms, which uh, perhaps are a consequence of the trauma that has been uh, visited upon uh, Native people. So as, as we think about healing, as we think about together trying to make the country stronger, but also by doing, doing that in a way that is just, that is not that does not try to do what is being done in other countries, which is to create kind of a generic reality and the destruction of, of difference. Uh, Carly, how do you see us as proceeding over the next uh, five to 10 years in ways that make the country uh, better, stronger, more unified, but also create a better basis for respect for future generations and for the diversity that has always been so important to, the, to, to America's success? How do we do this? It's going to take some work and it's going to take all of us. Um, and so, you know, our communities, yeah, we face a lot of challenges and, and all, you know, the, the challenges that were named um, in, in the, the survey you did are, are, are right on, um, you know, largely due to the ongoing impacts of, of colonization. You know, our, mem our member organizations at Native Ways, we're at the forefront of addressing these from supporting Native students, tribal colleges, supporting tribal economies, preservation of language and culture, cultural resources, supporting legal rights. Um, you know, all of this is, is, is incredibly important. Um, what we need to do is we need to listen to the folks who are the ones most impacted by these issues and recognize um, that we are not deficit. We are not deficits. Um, we have so many assets. We have so many strengths. While we do have a lot of challenges, um, we also have a lot of solutions. We just need the resources and the support to implement and to actualize um, our dreams. And so, you know, we need folks to, to be at the table, to be supportive um, of our solutions and recognize that while our, as Native population, you know, our population number is pretty small. And yet when you look at um, the solutions that we have to address some of the issues in our communities, our solutions are going to address these issues um, in other communities too. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, when, when, when folks are out there advocating for, for climate change, you know, climate justice, that they're not just doing that for native people. They're doing that for everybody. When we talk about changes in the public education system, it's not just to support native folks. It's to support everyone. When folks, you know, that reclaiming native truth study that, you know, talked about the, how little folks knew about native communities. It also showed that people want to know more. They do. And so what we need is we need folks to support some of the systemic change that needs to happen so that the solutions that our communities have and are, are ready to implement so that they can so that that can take place. And then we're all going to benefit from it. You know, um, I think you're right. Uh, ignorance creates victims of us all. Um, and and the way we can uh, change is by becoming better informed by communicating. I'm going to give the last word actually to Tim Johnston, who's, who wrote 
Other disadvantaged groups tend to have loud, uh, tend to be louder, but we need to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to thrive and that we take the time to meet people where they are, understand their traumas and find ways to support them in their journey. So um, that, that idea of all of us trying to make America a better place, it improves all of our lives, improves the lives of our country, and will ensure that, that uh, our children thrive Carly Bad Heart Bowl, Executive Director of the Native Ways Foundation in Minnesota, and Shannon O'Glachlan, uh, Chief Executive and Attorney at the Association on American Indian Affairs. Thank you so much for uh, healing to a small extent my own ignorance, and thank you for sharing the work of your organizations. And, and uh, please thank your staffs. Please thank your constituents. Uh, please thank the people who benefit and contribute to, to your work. Stay safe and have a great day. Thanks, for, thanks so much for, for helping us out. Thank you so Thank much. You.